I'm going to be in India the next two weeks, so uh, I'm going to get it all in today, all right? So just strap, strap up and get ready. Uh, so, um, yeah, so anyway, um, I'm just, I'm just going to give it all I got. Um, let's, uh, let's do this. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn it to Mark chapter 4, all right? We're going to be in uh, Mark 4, and uh, we're going to cover the first 20 verses uh, there, which talk about a parable from Jesus um, that I think we all need to take to heart and, uh, and, and hear um, today, all right? So let us have ears to hear, amen? amen? All right, here we go. Verse 1, again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it had not, uh, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing. Up to and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone with those around him and with the twelve, they asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in the parable. So that they may indeed see, but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will then you understand all the rest of the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation, persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns, They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke out the word, and it proves it unfruitful. But those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Okay. So Jesus tells a story. Uh, These stories are called parables. We talked about a lot of these last summer in our parable series. Um, And um, and I think we talked about 13, 14 different parables. This was the first one we started with last summer uh, as kind of a a setup for the parables because it really is a parable about parables. It's a parable about uh, if you can can hear uh, what is being said, then you know, essentially, your good soil, um, and uh, and so Jesus starts here. But I, what I want to do today is I want to help us understand um, the the meaning of this parable, but also um, also I, I want us to understand the significance of this parable. Okay, um, because those aren't always the same thing, and they're not uh, the the same thing. Um, and so, what is this parable? What is the meaning of this parable? Why does Jesus tell this parable? Well, the meaning of this parable is 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 pretty simple. It's it's the word, okay. So it's it's the word. 
Uh, it's about the word. The word is the main idea in this, uh, and then and then it's about different kinds of soil. Um, but you, what you need to know about all of Jesus' parables is Jesus' parables teach some sort of kingdom idea. All right, uh, they teach about the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is about. That's what he told us in Mark chapter one. He said, "I've come that you might know, and I might preach the good news of the kingdom uh, of uh, of God, the good news of the kingdom of God, which was." Um, ultimately him and of himself but what is Jesus talking about here in this specific parable what is the meaning of this parable specifically well Jesus is talking essentially about himself in this parable he's 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 the sower in the parable and so he's talking about himself he's uh, speaking as the one who is the sower, who is sowing the seed, who is preaching the word, who is bringing about the word of God, and this is what happens when he sows the seed. Some seed falls on the path, which a bird comes by and snatches up and takes away. Some seed falls along rocky soil, which, which takes uh, and, and sprouts up, but then quickly withers away because it was not didn't have a deep enough root. And then some uh, people hear it, and they, they, they really uh, love it, and it's great and it begins to grow something but it's amongst the thorns and certain things in life really begin to choke out that word that was sown there and then some fall on good soil and it produces a crop now jesus teaches this way because i mean everyone in the first century was a farmer right so like just just off off the cuff like we can already say this parable its meaning um, is is probably uh, is is stronger for the first century crowd than us because most of us are farmers and gardeners right but they can understand this a whole lot better than than we can they understand the idea of these different soil types and what grows and what doesn't and why things don't grow so forth and so on so he's teaching to them in a way they can understand but basically what he says is uh, when I teach there are certain people who Satan just comes and steals it away and they never really take it and they never really receive it that the evil one is is bent on keeping them from producing and growing um, anything in their life and then there's a group of people that I teach to and they love the word and they think it's great and they hear it um, but they don't really have any deep roots they're on rocky soil and they don't they don't have deep roots and it doesn't grow deep roots and, um, and what he's saying essentially is that there's a group of people that he's sitting with right then in that group. And it seems like he points out to these different groups as he's talking um, based on the way that it reads in Mark. It reads differently in other gospels. But based on the way it reads in Mark, it seems like he's like pointing. Is that these are the ones who, and these are the ones who. And, and so, but, w- but what he's saying is that there is this, there is this group of people um, who are going to hear the word and they're going to love it, and it's great, and they think it's awesome, and they're like, man, I got just, Jesus is so cool, so awesome, and, uh, and his, his word, his message is so awesome, but then life gets hard because they're following Jesus and because they're buying into his word, and they begin to be persecuted for that. They begin to be ridiculed for that. They begin to be, um, like, set apart and... and Put in, they put in some pretty bad, difficult situations of tribulation and trial, and they, in that moment, they are going to walk away. They aren't going to be there with Jesus anymore. And then there are this group of people that Jesus is talking to where he says, there's a group of you um, who are going to hear the word and they receive it with joy. Again, they think, man, Jesus is the man. He's awesome. He's the best. He's doing great. But then, like, they get something shiny dangled in front of them. And they go, oh, but what about that thing, right? Oh, but but I but this thing, you know, and they they just they just get so enamored with just the things of the world and the de- deceitfulness of riches and the deceitfulness of chasing and making their life about chasing after that instead of really letting the the word of God bear a fruit in their life. And so there's going to be that group of people that Jesus is talking to. And they're going to leave um, and because they're going to go after something else that they find more valuable than Jesus and his word and his mission. 
And then there's another group, and that group, uh, the word comes to them, and they take it, and they receive it, and it's good soil, and man, they, it, just, it just begins to grow, and, it, and they, they love it so much, and they're going to stick through all the difficult things. They're going to make sure that they, they're, the rocks are gone. They're going to make sure the thorns and the weeds get pulled. They're, they're being on guard against all kinds of other difficult situations and things, and they are producing good soil in themselves, and that way that they can go and they can actually continue to grow and they can begin to produce a crop and a harvest that goes far beyond them but reaches 30, 60, and 100 fold from there. And so Jesus, that, that's the meaning. The meaning is Jesus is talking to people in the first century. Um, he's not talking to us, okay? So we need to understand that that's the way the Bible works, okay? If we're gonna understand the word at all, we have to understand the word as we look at it. It has a meaning, Okay, and that meaning is really, really important. All of the word of God has a meaning. Okay, but not all of the word is equally significant to us. Okay, it it likely has significance, but it doesn't have the same significance that it had to first century Jews. Okay, Um, another example of this, a way that I can show this to you, is. or, or, or how we got this backwards. Most of us, okay, most of us as followers of Jesus in the, the first century American church context, we go to the Bible and we start looking for significance, okay? We start going, well, what does it say to me? Or what does it mean to me? And all of those things, right? But you can't get to significance until you deal with the actual meaning first, Right, And that's why most people, when they start a year-long reading plan, get to Leviticus, and then it goes, <laughs> right? Because Leviticus is a book of 300, or 613 laws from Moses about cutting boils off of your body and removing yourself from the community and living in isolation for however long until that heals and you're no longer bleeding and you're no longer unclean and all of these other kinds of things that don't apply to you and me, right? Can we just be honest, right? So, so does that have significance? Yes. What is the significance? The significance is God wants his people to be holy and set apart, okay? Does it mean the same thing for us that it meant for them? No, okay? So so we need to be careful to go to the word of God just to try and find where it's significant to us and 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 miss what it actually means, okay? And miss what Jesus is actually doing and what he's actually talking about. Now, um, another good example of this is is revelation uh we're studying the book of revelation in my life group right now i would love to invite anyone that would like to come come on all right sunday nights 5 30 right here in upper room one come 5 30 okay we're studying through revelation and revelation uh right now we're in the churches the seven churches um uh, oh, let me also clarify. We're not meeting tonight because of the Super Bowl, but we will be meeting next Sunday, all right? Uh, we'll be meeting next Sunday. Uh, so come next Sunday right here, Upper Room 1. If you want to hang out tonight, just find me after church. I'll send you my address. You can come to my house and watch a game with me. Uh, and, but, um, but, the, but, the, um, but the idea in Revelation is we're in the, the church's stage, and the second church is this church in Smyrna. The third church is this, this church in Pergamum. And, uh, and the idea behind uh, the church in Smyrna is they basically are commended for their faith and their strength in following Jesus um, and their, their commitment to the faith. And they follow Jesus all the way up to the point where John actually is saying, hey, you're doing great. Just hang in there. You're going to die for your faith, and it's okay. Whenever you die for your faith, there's a better reward waiting for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm likely going to be burned alive next week um, or die on a Roman cross, okay? So is that a significant piece of Scripture that means something to me? Yes. Does it mean the same thing to me that it meant to them? No. Does that make sense? Okay? Now, the church in Pergamum is a church that has given themselves over to a lot of of really wretched practices of their culture, specifically sexual immorality. And so they're they're in this place 
um, of where uh, sexual immorality is running rampant and the church has basically become okay with the idea because we have the grace of Jesus so we can indulge in whatever way we want. We can sleep with whoever we want. We can do whatever we want. We can proclaim whatever sort of sexual identity we want to proclaim, so forth and so on. Does that make sense? And, and the, 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 the thing that John says to that church is you must repent. Now, in a 21st century world that sounds a lot like Pergamum, that has more significance right now, doesn't it? When you're trying to say, well, yes, we want to be gracious, we want to be loving, we want to be inviting, we want to be uh, kind to all children of God, and yet we will stand on the truths that are set in the New Testament and tell us to stand on as far as it comes to how we behave sexually, right? We're going to uphold a New Testament sex ethic, right? That, that has more of a, more of a, a, per, or, or a significance, okay? So, so do you get what I'm saying? You have to read the Bible, understand what it means to the people, and then you have to go, okay, is, is this significant to me, and how is it significant to me? All right? So let's talk about the significance of this parable, because it is significant. We talked about the meaning. The meaning Jesus was trying to portray to a crowd of people and a group of people who were sitting there with him right then to help some of them know you're going to fall away, and some of you are going to remain steadfast, and you're going to bear a, a great crop. But what's the significance for us? Well, um, if it's about the word, let's start there, okay? If it's about the word, we, we get to be uh, post-resurrection, post-New Testament Christians, we get to go a little bit further on what the word is and where is the word and where do we find the word, right? Um, and so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says that all Scripture, which is what we consider the Word of God, is God-breathed, okay? That word breathed in the Greek is the word pneuma. It's the same word that we use for spirit um, or the Holy Spirit. In, the, in, in, in Hebrew, it would be ruach, okay? So it would be the Spirit of God. Um, so what he's saying is that all of God's Word, all of the Scriptures are God-breathed, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Which means immediately just from there, right, it cannot have any flaw, it cannot have any error, and it cannot have any blemish, right? If we believe that that's true, which I believe that's true, then, then that's what we are saying, that, that it's God-ordained, it's God-breathed, it's God-speaking, it's His words, even though it might have been written by someone else. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it. And it is given to us in order that we might be taught. So for teaching, you write these four words down. Teaching, all right? Uh, rebuking, uh, correcting, and, uh, oh my goodness, training. There we go. I almost missed that one. Uh, so, so these are the things that the word of God is given to us to do in order that, in verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3, it says, in order that man might be complete. That word complete can also be uh, used or, or said to be perfect. It can be, you know, all, like moved over and used uh, either word. Most translations prefer to use the word complete because when we start talking about people being perfect, we, whew, you know, we, we all know how bad that goes, how fast, you know? Um, and so, so, but it says, in order that we might be complete, able to do the good works he has for us. So his, his job, or the, the word's job in our life and in the scriptures is that God might speak to us, teach us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us that we might be able to do what he has for us to do. Okay? It's, that's, that's it. And so if, if we go back to the context of this parable... What would it mean to be good soil for us? We have to ask ourselves, are we good soil or not? 
Is the word of God, is it teaching us? Is it tra- rebuking us, correcting us? Is it training us? And, and so that we can do what God has for us to do. There's something that has to happen with the word of God. There's a process that takes place with the word of God. Um, it, it has to be taught. So it has to be taught. Then it has to be heard. Okay? Okay. And then it has to be lived. Let's say lived out. I like that better. All right? So it has to be taught, it has to be heard, and then it has to be lived out. So it has to be taught to us. We have to be able to hear it. We have to be able to hear it when it rebukes us and corrects us and trains us and teaches us. We have to be able to take it in and then begin to do what we need to do from there with it. Does that make sense? Okay? So, when the word of God is sown, when it's tossed out, are we the kind of soil that that hears it, that hears it, and then does something with it? That's good soil in this parable. Okay? So that's one really significant aspect. And we should ask ourselves, are we good soil? Right? We should all ask ourselves that question all the time. Because I don't know if you realize, but that's really the only, <laughs> only one who isn't completely choked out or withered at the end, (laughs) right? It's the only one producing something at the end. It's the only one bearing fruit at the end. And so it has to be lived out. Now, the other aspect of significance that this has for us is if we are living it out, then we are also, we are also, um, we are also sowing seed. So this has a twofold significance that, that we, as followers of Jesus, have to not only hear the word of God and take it in and live it out, but to live it out actually means that we become sowers ourselves. Do you guys know this? Do you see this? And the reason why we have part of living it out is teaching. And why do we teach? We teach so that others might hear. And so that others might live it. And then they might teach it as well. See, the reality is, is that this is how the kingdom of God grows. This parable is about the kingdom of God, and it's about reaping a harvest, and it's about growing 30, 60, and 100 fold what was sown in uh, the good soil. The way that that happens is this right here. The soil is sown. We heard it. We began to live it out. We began to sow it so other people could hear it, so they could live it out. They start sowing it, other people hear it, and they live it out, and this is how it happens. I, I, I however, I feel very conflicted to say that I don't think, I think most of us, we want we want to hear this, um, and we really, we really like, we really like hearing the word. A lot of us, we really, I mean, like some of us are like, man, can we, can John Piper please put out four more sermons this week? I just got to get more, John Piper. I gotta, I gotta get more. Um, somebody's like, oh man, the Bible Project put out a new series. <laughs> Woo! You know, I, and I'm, I'm fans of all of that, okay? Please. No, I am fans of all of that. We can get so enamored with hearing and learning, and we never, and it never translate 
and never go to obedience. Never go to actually living out the word or, or even sowing seed ourselves and proclaiming it to others. It's so easy for us to do that. And so easy for us to say, well, you know, it's the job of the church to help people find Jesus and follow him, right? And when we say that, we say, it's the job of this gathering on Sunday mornings to help people find Jesus and follow him. No, it's, it's all of our jobs to help people find Jesus and follow him. And we have to be throwing out seed. We have to be sharing the gospel. See, here's, here's what I want you to understand. Our church is set up um, this way. We set up, or we try to, encourage you to set yourself in a place where you can hear the voice of God really well. That's how, what we would consider your being with Jesus. Right? In order to be, in order to hear Jesus, you actually have to be with him. Is that fair? Okay. So you actually have to give yourself to some practices where God can actually speak to you. Community, silence and solitude. You need, you need to be in the word of God, right? You need to be coming to church and, and listening to sermons and growing and all, all of it. You need to give yourself to some practices that make it possible for you to hear God and be with Jesus so that you can hear what he has for you. But once you hear it, it's now time to live it out. And that's what it means to start becoming like Jesus. When you're becoming like him, do you know what he lived out? He lived out the scriptures. You want to know what Jesus was doing when he showed up on earth? He says, I have not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. Which means all the stuff in the Old Testament that is written, he came to live it out perfectly when no one else could. So his life is an interpretation of what it meant for God to say, this is what a human being is supposed to look like. A human being walking in relationship with God looks like Jesus. That was his whole point. So when it begins to be lived out, who do we start to look like? Jesus, <laughs> right? So we hear it, we get alone with him, we be with him, we get alone with him, we hear what he has to say, and then we begin to live like him, and we begin to do the things that he began to do. What were some of the things that he did? Well, I mean, he said his mission was to preach. Some of y'all are like, well, I didn't go to Bible college, Eric. I don't have an MDiv. Preach. Do what he did. Because that's how the kingdom grows. You're not responsible for the, the soil unless the soil is you. Do you understand? Like, throw the seed out. If it lands on rocky soil or it lands among thorns, that's not your fault. Throw the seed. Preach the gospel. Tell people about the hope that you have. Because that's how God's kingdom comes to earth as it is in heaven. It's through that. So are we good soil? We have to ask ourselves. Hopefully we are. But we also have to ask ourselves, are we sowing seed that hopefully will land upon other good soil and begin to just grow the kingdom beyond our wildest imagination? Because that's not just my job. It's all of our job. And can I be honest with you? I don't think I'm very good at it. I got it. We, we all have to make this a point of emphasis or a point of focus or we can just get really enamored. We're showing up to be with Jesus and man, I'm just with Jesus all the time. And in the process, we're not becoming any more like him. And we're not, we're not doing any of the things that he did. He said, I've come. 
I want you guys to understand this. I have come to seek and save the lost. I have come not for the righteous, but the sinner. I have come in order to give sight to the blind and set captives free. That's why Jesus came. And so I think that's what we should be doing too. We should be going after people who are lost. We all know them. Do you remember what it was like to be lost? It's hard for me to remember because I have been in the church my whole life. My dad was a pastor who taught the Bible every week. It's hard for me to remember a time where I felt lost. Can I, can I say, um, I went, I, I'll just be honest with you, I went to church for 13 years as a young child. Um, I think knowing a lot about the Bible as even a young kid um, could um, and yet had no desire to really follow Jesus. I made um, I made a claim when I was when I was 13. I said, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. And I was baptized, and I gave my life to Christ. And I said, no turning back. And like less than a year later. I was so wickedly far from God. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but I don't think I stopped believing. I don't think I was no longer a Christian. I just think I, I really got excited about the gospel. But there were just some things that came out. There's some rocks and thorns that hadn't been pulled or hadn't been done away with yet and my heart just went in those other directions and the faith that I had and the hope that I had in Jesus quickly was withering or was getting choked out by all of that stuff. And it wasn't until I was about 17 years old, it was like, you know, three years later of living a life choked out and, and completely withering um, in a pile of rocks that I really said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. And I got my Bible out at 17 and I started reading the Bible because I was just going through hell. Like literally, I felt like I was going through hell on earth. And so I just got to the Word because I felt like, man, that's the only thing. The Word was all I knew right, that could, that could help me in this situation, that it, that it might, that might help me do something in me. And so I started reading it, and man, I got to be honest with you, I went looking for significance, and I couldn't find a thing. <laughs> I couldn't find a thing. And I would read it, though. I just kept reading it, and I kept reading it, and I kept reading it, I kept reading it, until I was 19 years old, and I was a pastor, uh, at that time, um, at, 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 a, at a small church uh, in, in East Tennessee, and I uh, had no idea what I was doing. I was just pastoring these, these ambitious high school students at 19 years old and middle school students. I was trying to teach them the Bible. I had no idea what it said. I had no idea what it meant. I was just trying to find significance still, and I was just like, you know, this is what this passage means. And, uh, and it wasn't at all what this, that passage meant, so please, God, forgive me for teaching heretical things uh, when I was 19. But I didn't know any better. I was just, but I, but I was hungry for the word still, and I wanted it. And then I got, I got alongside of another guy when I was 19 or 20, and, uh, and he said, hey, why don't, why don't you come? Why don't you come uh, work with me, and I'll show you how to do this thing called ministry. And so he did, and he showed me how to read the Bible, and he showed me how to understand the Bible, and he showed me how to teach, and he showed me how to preach, and he showed me how to love people and care for people. And, and you know what the m most amazing thing that he showed me? He showed me Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. 
And he said, you, you want to know what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus? Just open up those, those pages and try and do everything on those three chapters. And when you begin reading them, you're like, I am a horrible Christian. <laughs> like, I have no chance of going to heaven if that's what it takes. And, um, and man, but, but I just fell in love with those three chapters of Scripture. And I just fell in love with making it my life's mission to try and become like the, the people that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. People who are poor in spirit. People who are meek who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, people who are, are pure in heart, people who mourn over their sin, people who are peacemakers in our world and bring restoration and healing to broken things. I, I wanted to be salt and light. That, that, that's, uh, that's all I'm trying to do. Right? And... And I gotta be honest with you guys, ever since my hunger for God and my hunger for his word and my hunger for his kingdom have never, ever waned. There's nothing, nothing other than, other than God himself and my family uh, that I love more than trying to go after the kingdom of God. To try and take back lost souls from hell. I want it hard. I want it to be hard for anyone in Holly Springs to go to hell. Because Lake Springs Church was here. And not just its pastor preached the gospel, but its people preached the gospel. And if that is what we do, if that is what we do, then I think we can all say with a lot of confidence we are good soil. And that the, the, the harvest that God is bringing about 30, 60, and 100 fold far beyond what we could imagine or do in of ourselves is taking shape. Because we just heard the word, began to live it out, and begin to do what it calls us to do. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for today. And uh, thank you for just your... Thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, you have laid out the path before us. It is to take your word so deeply within our hearts that we begin to do what it is that you call us to do. We begin to preach and share the gospel with anyone that will listen. We begin to sow seed. But God, as we do, there will be persecution. There will be those who do not like it, who want us to be quiet. But I pray that we will just stay bold and confident with truth. I pray that we will be gracious to those who persecute us who want to challenge the truth in which we hold dear. I pray that you will give us hearts to love them like you love us. For as we do not know what we are doing a lot of the time, they may not either. God, I, I, as we preach your word and proclaim your word and share your word, there are going to be uh, things that take place and things that happen where, where there are going to be opportunities for us to leave another path, to chase after another direction, one that looks really good and enticing. And God, I just pray that you will keep our eyes focused on you. I pray that we will have practiced things that keep us disciplined to know that we are on the right path. 
with your word. And that we will not be choked out. God, I pray that we, I pray that we come to know what it means to be good soil. I pray that we know and can say that we are good soil. God, I pray that you will use us, not me, but us, this body of believers, to produce a crop of 30, 60, and 100 fold what we believe to be possible. Do more than we could ask or imagine just through our willingness and faithfulness and obedience to share the reason of our hope in season and out of season. God, may you grow and build your church. May you grow and build your kingdom here in Holly Springs as it is in heaven. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.